Welcome back. We continue our look at space exploration 40 years after man landed on the moon. Joining me are Pam Melroy, a NASA astronaut who commanded the Space Shuttle Discovery, Dr. Farouk Elbaz, a geologist who trained the Apollo astronauts and helped to select lunar landing sites, and Anusha Ansari, the first private female space explorer. Now, we were discussing one of the reasons, you know, delays and so on, that uh, the delay in getting back to um, uh, the moon and, and further exploration. But um, Anusha Ansari, if I can put this to you, that it came in on the live station from our live station chat room from David in Washington, D.C., who says, do you, in your opinion, does the U.S. government need to be the leader in heading to Mars, or can it be an international effort by private interests independent of any particular state? I believe in collaboration. I think private industries and entrepreneurs can bring a lot of value to the program. I think NASA has started looking into collaboration with uh, private industries. Uh, an example is uh, the collaboration they have with SpaceX and their successful launch recently. Uh, so I believe it requires both parties to work together and uh, the efficiencies that you find in the private industries, you can get that in government agencies and I think that's the value they bring to the table. So Mars is an audacious goal and it requires a lot of uh, research and a lot of innovation and I think unless we get everyone involved, and it has to be an international collaboration, I don't think it's uh, wise to take on that task as an individual country. I think if we do collaboration, we'll be able to accomplish it much faster, more efficient and better. Well, Colonel Pam Melroy, do you, do you think there is the political will to push that, that far towards Mars? Do you think that in the same way perhaps that uh, America and the Soviet Union were racing to the moon uh, you know, under President Kennedy in the, in the 60s, do you think there is the kind of political will to perhaps push towards Mars? Oh, I think there absolutely is, and it's not just in the United States. It's around the world. Uh, children in particular are very inspired by the thought that the first person to set foot on the surface of Mars is born and is in school today. That's going to happen in about 20 to 25 years, which means some child in school right now will be the first person to set foot on Mars. And I think we understand that in the United States, and I know it's understood throughout the world. I think there is the will and that we have to work together to do it. Dr. Farouk Alvaz, uh, what, I mean, in terms of, from a ge so geologist's perspective, what potential interest could there be uh, from Mars? What could we get in terms of resources? Is there any, anything like that that we should actually be looking for as well? Uh, the first item that we should consider is the fact that uh, Mars did have water in the past in large volumes. There was quite a bit of rain, and there are valleys, dry valleys, dry w valleys on Mars that took water from the highlands to the lowlands. And some of that water is uh, in under the soil of Mars as ice. And therefore, the living conditions on Mars will be very different and much easier than living on the moon because you would have water. And that is not a small item there. Mm. And then one of the most significant things about Mars is the fact that it is really identical to the deserts of the Earth. There are features on the deserts of the Earth that are identical in shape and, and topography and all other aspects, just like the features of Mars. So because Mars had gone through the same kind of geological uh, changes as the uh, deserts of the Earth. So there is quite a bit of relationship between the Earth and Mars. And when we study Mars, we will learn more about, about our own deserts. Now, Dr. Dr. Elbaz, you know, one thing that's happened is that, of course, President George Bush just a, a few years ago was saying that, you know, he had an ambitious plan to get back to the moon by 2020, perhaps as a, a stepping stone to go onto Mars. He didn't deliver the funding. President Obama seems to be sending out mixed signals, uh, and he's announced a boost for NASA's funding, but he's also saying that uh, it's open to review. So I wonder um, what you expect to happen to exploration, the pace of exploration under the Obama administration. I think the mixed reviews right now and the comments from right and left is because the President Bush's uh, initiative was not really right. It's uh, because we said that we go to the moon so we can go to Mars. I mean, well, do we, or do we, the, the rocket that goes, that lifts something to the moon, would it be good enough to go to Mars? The answer is no. Would the spacecraft that would land on the moon be good enough to land on Mars? No. Do we need to really go to, to the moon with humans right now? The answer is also no, we've done that. We can do a great deal about uh, lunar exploration by unmanned robotic machines. And we really should have the objective right now to think about a Mars mission that had nothing to do with the Apollo missions because the, the, the technology has changed, all kinds of things have changed. And now we can have this collaboration that Anusha was talking about. And therefore, we should focus on a very specific objective to go to Mars within a very specific period of time 
so that we can recapture the imagination of people because people would like to know what is the objective and would also know the, the, the end game, just like the way Apollo was done. Well, Anusha and Sari, actually a question I'm going to ask you to answer that came in from, uh, from email by, uh, from Anas Malik. Many people uh, reflected what Anas Malik wrote in, and I'm going to, it's a little bit of a devil's advocate question. It says, a lot of problem on Earth needs to be, uh, need to be addressed. Global warming is one. Going to Mars sounds great, but let's take care of our planet and then head elsewhere. So why, you know, there's an argument for redirecting resources towards the Earth before we look anywhere else. Of course, you know, it's an expensive proposition. I think you had, had a fairly hefty bill getting up into space as well. How do, when someone says to you, well, wouldn't the money be better used on Earth and improving conditions here. How do you respond to them? Well, I tell them I don't believe that we can fundamentally solve the problem on Earth unless we uh, learn how to use our resources in space and efficiently and effectively use those resources. So um, I look at um, space and space exploration as means of learning about problems on Earth and learning about solutions that may not exist here on our planet. Uh, we have gone back and forth on global warming and uh, uh, other alternative sources of energy, whereas we can find those energy and resources out there. And uh, a lot of conflicts are caused because of resource contention. Mm. And a lot of these resources are plentiful in so space. So it could be like a release valve in some ways. Yes, for us. Yeah, well, exactly. let's get a call in from Lee in Virginia here. Good to have you with us, Lee. What would you like to ask? Thank you very much, and a very, a very excellent discussion. Uh, essentially, in, in <clears throat> when we went to the moon in the 60s, uh, all sorts of technologies uh, popped up as a result of, of the research that was done to get us there. Everything from uh, solid-state electronics to Velcro to, uh, to integrated circuits, uh, on and on. What would the technologies that the ladies and, and the gentlemen um, uh, foresee us um, ex exploring and, and committing to that would help us get to Mars, or are we really going to rely on the same old technologies and just essentially concentrate on getting there? That's, that's an interesting question, Lee, actually. Perhaps Colonel uh, Pam Mel Melroy could uh, touch on this. Of course, people joke about the fact that the uh, modern car has more technology than the original Apollo missions that went up uh, back in the 60s. What, what do you see on the inside as, as the technologies that, that are driving that push forward? Well, I think one of the most exciting things that can come out of a trip and will come out of a trip to Mars are things that do address the problems that we have here on Earth, specifically sustainability. I mean, obviously, when you get ready to go to Mars, you have to take everything with you and reuse it, recycle it, or figure out how to make it work. There's no place to stop. You can't go to the grocery store or the hardware store. Uh, you can't go pick up more uh, equipment or tools or food. And so it's going to really be a lesson in how to sustain ourselves uh, in a very limited environment, which I think could solve a lot of problems here on Earth. Now, it's, it's interesting, uh, uh, Dr. Albaz, the, you know, there's, a, there's this issue about um, the, the time involved in, in us making some progress. And, and perhaps it's a, it's a bit of a mean question, but, you know, with 12, 12 men got to the moon, nine are still alive. In, in your opinion, the way things are going right now, what chances is there those who are, who are still around will have a chance to see someone else get up onto that lunar surface again uh, while they're still around? It's quite possible because I, I really think that uh, s some of the uh, astronauts are in very good physical shape and uh, they, they, they all are also motivated to continue and see things and do things and, and they are these are very motivated people and they will, they will continue by sheer em em emotion. No, I was no, I was I was thinking more in the sense that it's you know th is there any chance that all this hope that's being built up as we get to this 40th anniversary, you know, people will be disappointed again that the the buzz goes and and we suddenly find ourselves, you know, the program is sort of put to one side again. Oh, I see. But I, I really think that there is the uh, there is a buzz right now for Mars. There is no question about it that the American people in general, and the quite a bit of the people around the world, are uh, cheering for a mission to Mars. And one of the things that uh, affect the space program in general is the interest of the people themselves and if we see that so many people are pushing for it the politicians would listen because spending on the space program is are these are sums that are not huge sums by any stretch of imagination and also these sums are being spent on research centers on universities professors and their graduate students so this the money that's spent on the space program only helps the economy by developing new things new technologies new ideas and and in, uh, motivating the young generation to innovate and do the new things and the technology that we'll, we will use to go to Mars will be very vastly different from the technology we went to the moon because of that innovation.
So we're, it's here, and I think the, the call has, has been made yet. All right. Well, you know, Anusha Ansari, one thing that uh, I know you don't like the term space tourist. You, of course, were the first female space explorer. And I wonder, uh, when, you, when you look at how some companies are pushing the idea of space tourism, Virgin Galaxy, of course, being one, how do you see that idea? Do you, do you see any merit in, in considering space as a venue for tourists? A quick thought. Uh, I think uh, definitely because it's sort of a low-hanging fruit in private industries getting involved. There is a business case for it, low Earth orbit and just getting outside the atmosphere. It's certainly an experience worthwhile and it would be just an introduction for people to see how it feels to be in space. And not everyone would want to go to orbit and spend several days uh, in orbit. So I think it's a viable business plan and I'm mm. looking forward to it. Fingers crossed we get to, to see some of that. And I want to thank you very much, uh, Nishan Sari. Dr. Farouk al great to have you back. And Colonel Pam Melroy, thank you for being with us. Thank you. And thank you for uh, sending us your questions. On the next show, we look at how international criminal courts go after prosecuting heads of state, and why more Western leaders haven't been brought in front of them. Don't forget, you can call me and uh, follow the show via Facebook. Log on to uh, get updates and submit your questions and comments. From me and the team, we'll see you next time.